Let's go, people. All right. It's May 23rd, 2016. We're opening the school committee meeting. Okay, so here's what we're doing now. We um, have, as you all know, but let's tell our viewing audience that we have just made the determination that it is important for us to restructure how we provide special education programming because the our trial of an assistant superintendent resulted in a um, taxing job where we had our assistant superintendent regularly putting in 60 hour weeks or more. I'm sure. yeah. <laughs> so what we've done is we've um, made that position, we've moved some responsibilities over to the superintendent and we have made that one position, one and a half positions, a SPED coordinator. We already, Annie already talked about who we've hired for that. And we are now interviewing for a part-time special ed administrator. We advertised for that position. We had three candidates that met our minimum qualifications. One did not understand it was a part-time job and removed themselves from the running. The, we had a committee of um, two CPAC members, two teachers, Annie and I, that interviewed the other two remaining candidates. We now are doing a second interview of those two candidates. Our first is Pat. Pat, where are you going to be? Where do you want to go? I don't know. What's the most? Um, where, what do we do for sound quality? What do you want? Where do, would you like Pat to be? I could stand, I suppose. Right oh God! Or I can sit here. There. there. Horrible. I don't know don't if you're going to get to hear me or not. I'll sit. How about that? There's a mic right there. Okay. Um, I know I was asked to not necessarily provide something in writing, but I was given some guidance on what you wanted to talk about t this evening. And for my own sake, I did write mm -hmm. some notes. So <laughs> I can give you those. Um, so, um, so for our for our interview committee member who's here, what we ended up doing on is Annie and I had a conversation and decided to send out one question in advance and ask both candidates to give a 10 minute, no more than 10 minute presentation on that question, which is very long. <laughs> it was a very long, meaty, meaty question. So I did break it down, and I think I can Should you want us to talk about like, it in 10 is minutes. It just, is it on your thing? No, I don't think so. OK, go, Annie. So is this on? Both candidates. No, did you write yes, She the, says yes. No, I was asking if you add, put the question on the top of your paper. I just didn't express no, the question correctly. No, I didn't. Correctly. I, I couldn't get it on two pages if I did that. Yeah. So both candidates were asked to do the following. In lieu of a traditional question and answer interview format, you will be given the opportunity to speak to the school committee and viewing public about your ideas regarding the design and delivery of effective special education programs and services. You will have no more than 10 minutes to describe what you consider to be a high quality special, to be high quality special education programming from pre-K through age 22. After your statement presentation to the school committee, members of the committee may ask follow-up questions. We understand that it is impossible to have specialized programming for every type of exceptionality or disability. We are interested in hearing what types of special education programs and services are critical to provide in preschool, elementary, middle, secondary, and post-secondary to ensure as many students as possible have access to the curriculum in the least restrictive setting and have the ability to participate as fully as possible in extracurricular activities in the life of the school or community. Please speak specifically about what you consider key transition points in a student's education, including post-secondary transition, and what steps the district should take to ensure successful transitions, how and when you have involved students in decision-making and in the team process, specifically around transitions, your experience providing professional development to help staff implement effective instruction, your experience designing and implementing budgets including grants management that support effective special education programs and service delivery, your experience ensuring effective communication with parents, staff, outside service providers regarding programs, services, and student progress. Please speak to how you assess the effectiveness of communication. 
It was a little long. All in 10 minutes. <laughs> yeah, could you just <laughs> summarize that? <laughs> All right. So in general, I think um, special education programming has to address uh, any child that walks to the door as a resident of your community and whatever their strengths and weaknesses might present themselves. And I think that's a school's responsibility and not just special ed's responsibility. And I see um, the role of a special education staff um, to be able to identify and adapt to those needs that come into, and their strengths. And I think that we, we have to serve children in all those um, myriad of ways because for anyone who has a weakness in one area or another, and we all do, can identify them ourselves in our daily lives, we need to capitalize on our strengths. So to overcome any disadvantage, we have to play up our advantages and our talents. And I think that's a role that especially is critical for kids that come with significant challenges. So I see the job of the director is to instill that kind of ethic in their staff and in the people that they work with that all these children are our children and we want the best for all our children like we would our own and that's um, I think the philosophical basis of what special education has to provide. Um, the, the most important preschool, I mean transitions are numerous and I really see child development in stages that has individual and specific needs developmentally and that every one of the ones that I outlined for you are really significant because I do believe in uh, the hierarchy of needs that Maslow put in front of us many years ago and I do believe that if we do not take care of the basement um, security of our children we will not get the best adult we can possibly afford them. So I think in um, the preschool years, it's really important to give kids a sense of security, utmost importance. Um, it goes not only to them, but to their parents, that they have to feel confident that their children are safe and in a welcoming place. Um, I think it's really important for us to impart pre-academic skills for those children, um, self-regulation and social skills are primary before you can expect a child to learn to read or write or to count. Any of those are really important. So um, knowing that developmentally anyone between three and five might be in a huge spectrum of abilities that we try to work really hard on early intervention and provide those skills to be as strong as possible before we start making academic demands on children. And um, the transition from a home environment to a school environment has to not only be safe and fun, but also ready those children for the social and academic demands they're going to see down the road. Um, I do believe that in grade one, their little minds are ready, they're curious, and they're ready to be introduced to more abstract concepts, although we have to keep it very concrete. That's a huge shift when you ask a child to start thinking abstractly, and not every child's ready, so we have to be flexible again in there. I think um, as the ch children get older, their ability to get the academic swing and those expectations um, becomes more commonplace and then we begin to look at allowing them self-expression and determining their own voice, their place in their community within the room, within the school, within their, um, their community, ever expanding that circle of support and acceptance for them. Um, when you get to the older grades, I think it's really important and I've been working with the elementary staff to um, provide ways after we get a firm foundation of reading skills, which has been a primary focus for the last two years because we've recognized some gaps in our instruction, so we've really tried to shore up our reading instruction. Um, once you empower a child to have a voice, you need to learn to express that in multiple ways. So the written expression becomes really, really important. So I think in those transition years between grades three and five especially, Empowering kids to have a voice and then teaching them multiple ways of expressing it is really, really important because when you get to the secondary level, if you do not have those skills in place, it becomes that much more challenging. 
So I do see that um, you know the basics, <laughs> mathematical number sense, reading, and then writing, written expression, are vital. Um, seventh and eighth grade, I think middle school is um, an exciting time for kids. Their minds are really opening up, and they are realigning themselves in social ways that we all love and hate at the same time. <laughs> so I do think that although academic rigor is a savior for many children, especially those with disabilities, and finding a, a niche is the most important thing in their own identity, that we can still push academic um, rigor as a way of uh, maintaining self-esteem and maintaining a place in the world, even when their social world seems confusing and challenging and sometimes threatening. So um, I see all of those stages as getting ready for the stage of life where children are going to take responsibility for themselves. And I do believe that that's a huge transition from seventh to ninth grade, and that kids need to be armed with the adequate tools for being academic people, but also socially responsible people, and then taking ownership of their own experiences, whether it's social or academic. Um, by the time they're in 11th grade, they need to have a vision for themselves and just be supported in that vision to take responsibility after living with a parent and moving on into an independent expectation for themselves. I think through all of this, it's a parental walk as well, and I think it's very hard from the first day of preschool or kindergarten for parents to let go of their kids, and it's equally hard for them in the 12th or beyond grades. So I think this is also a partnership with parents, not just a student-centered um, activity. So that covers part one. <laughs> I'll keep going. Um, I've touched a little bit on um, students' expectations in determining their own outcomes. And I really think even though students are invited at the age of 14 and beyond to attend each meeting, I don't think kids are necessarily ready or comfortable with that idea. Many of them may be, but I think parents are also sometimes uncomfortable talking about their children in the way that we do in front of them. I think it's a process that's very individualized. I want to see every ninth grader on part of their meeting because they don't take ownership if they don't have a voice there. And so even though it may be sometimes uncomfortable for the parent, it's, um, it's a growth exercise for them as well. And I always put that independence as a primary goal for whatever level of function a child comes to school with and leaves with. I hope that we can maximize their independence. Um, I am pleased with what's happened in the guidance department in the last couple of years. I see them taking a much more active role in helping children, student, young adults identify their strengths and weaknesses, where they fit into the real world, and the Naviance program gives them real concrete evidence of where they may have an inkling, but now they have a very clear profile that they can relate to. And if it's wrong, they need to get back in there and discuss why that doesn't fit them. But without that kind of feedback from a more subjective source, not the parent, not necessarily a teacher, but allowing themselves to evaluate their own skills and strengths and weaknesses, I think is a great tool that we've instituted there. Um, we have a fabulous secondary special education teacher whose strength really is transition for the students leaving their high school careers or not, extending their special ed services until grade 22. We have worked through the Mass Rehab Commission to get student services before they graduate. We have placed children in the ICE, which is the in, um, Inclusive Concurrent Enrollment Program with UMass. Um, there's also one available at Holyoke Community College. Um, we have set up children, our young adults, to have community work experiences before they graduate. And we are sending um, more students, two students next year, to the ICE program. And we have one going to the farm program over in Hatfield that's run by ServiceNet. And we have um, increased their abilities to get into the community independent of their families and actually take care of themselves in real ways like planning and executing menus, purchasing, cooking. We just had 
luncheon provided by uh, these students last week, um, all with the guidance, but really very self-sufficient behaviors of their own. So that was really a pleasure to, to see them do that. Um, uh, professional activities and um, developing some inst institutional and uh, targeted market, um, groups of training I've outlined, and I, I don't know if I got them all, but that's been a very busy part of my last couple years of experience, and I think it's directed specifically to where administration and teachers, parents, and students themselves have asked for attention. And I think we have um, done a lot in the area of school culture, PBIS, and behavior in many different ways. We've trained paraprofessionals to take UMass courses online to get familiar with ABA, which is that Applied Behavior Analysis. And we've done district-wide PBIS and school culture um, work with professional development. More specifically, I've mentioned in my first interview that we've been working on the tiered interventions for reading. We're working into the um, writing aspects of that continuum of skills. Um, I worked with Chris just this morning to secure the money we need to buy a research-based writing curriculum for those grades four through six so that we can get those skills back up to where we hope to see them before they enter the secondary setting. Um, I've been delighted to get to have really strong relationships with our bus drivers, I have to say. That has been a real critical part for us having improved data on the buses. They really feel like we um, respect and own them, and it's paid off in really good relationships on most of those vehicles, and it's, um, it's a testament to their abilities to really relate to the kids and to the kids trust them. So I'm feeling really positive about that change. Um, I've taken on a number of student um, groups, and not many, time doesn't allow, but I have been approached to write a little, some scripts for some PBIS training, which I've enjoyed doing. I have a group of fifth and sixth grade students who asked me to be a, a mentor or a club um, guide for their and their environmental interests. So we meet weekly and have been doing that all year. It's been um, great to see them in that interest and it gets me to tie back to my roots of uh, more of an environmental science major. Uh, the bu budget process is um, definitely just business and it's built on student needs and staff staffing and spacing and what do we need to once we analyze where our children are what kind of services they need we have um, I actually pull up service grids to analyze the number of hours predicted by IEPs that have been written so we can schedule and budget for the appropriate number of service hours for any of the related services we try to balance caseloads across the grade levels depending on how many students are in each individual grade so that we do not have somebody with a caseload of 16 and somebody with a caseload of 40, you know, so we are flexible in that. Um, we have tried to be abreast of what our future will look like with the children entering in the earliest grades so that we can plan ahead for their needs when those academic demands change. Because a child with severe needs may be very happy in a kindergarten, first grade classroom, but when those academic demands increase, and typically for many disab disabilities, second and third grade become very, very challenging. So we have to plan for more forms of support outside of the general education setting. And I think that we're, um, we're pretty proficient at identifying those and finding ways to make our staffing work to give them enough support to uh, maintain their inclusive status. That doesn't always work. Some children need more. Mm -hmm. So we're very mindful of who those children are. We work with families to find the best possible options for them. And uh, although I'm happy that to say that Hadley has very few, relatively speaking, outside placements, 
there are times when that's necessary and we work our best effort to find the best fit for that child and that family. Mm -hmm. And those are predictable costs, so they become part of the formula for claiming reimbursement from the state, but as you know, that formula on their end constantly changes. Mm -hmm. So um, I've been, I'm, I'm adept at their programming. I go every year so that we can avoid audits. If I don't get trained every year, I'm on the audit maybe list, so I always go to the training so that we can, um, number one, be accurate in my reporting, but also um, do the best job of avoiding lots of bureaucracy because that ties you up when you don't, you have better things to do. So that's typically what I would do there. Um, I mentioned the amount of money that we do get normally in a ballpark figures for the special ed related grants. Um, the 165000 is the 240 grant, which is mostly supporting the cost of out-of-district tuitions and transportation. But we, um, I work with Annie and with Chris very closely to make sure that we can cover the cost equitably and still allow me some money to meet unexpected or unusual requests. It might be equipment, it might be a new curriculum, it might be additional staffing, any of those things that might come up in the year. We keep a cushion there to be able to respond quickly to a need that might arise during the year. Um, I am proud to say that we've really developed some strong relationships with our neighbors. We have um, solicited help from UMass personnel over the last three years. We've had some of that in very low costs and sometimes in gratis so that we've been able to take advantage of their expertise when we need it without incurring a lot of cost. Um, we are constantly hoping for more internships and I'm working today actually with um, the School of Education to get an internship in our K through, I mean our K through three education special ed room um, for next year, and that will be a great asset for our our staff. And uh, I talked to Jack Horgan today. I said, "Well, when you leave, you brought all the school psych interns. How are we going to keep that relationship alive?" So we will use his reputation to <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> to keep that alive. Um, the last thing you asked me to address was communication. And um, in general, I try to respond to people as quickly as possible. Um, I, I know that it's difficult sometimes that a day may or two may go by and I'll have 150 emails I didn't read yet. And so that's how fast they pile in. But it's definitely a priority for me to not let those responses go for very long. So I try to give 24 to 48 hours of um, response time. Um, I take walk-ins all the time, my door is open, I've got a wedge under there to keep it there unless um, it's dismissal time. <laughs> um, and it's definitely um, a thing that I value a lot to not put people in a line waiting for attention. I, I want to be able to meet the attention as it's needed because that's when um, you know, something that may seem critical, may seem less critical 24 hours later, but um, an upset person is never a very productive one, so I try to at least get to respond in some shape or form. Um, my communications with faculty are very strong at the elementary level. I am constantly involved and I'm constantly responding to things that go on on the floors during the day. It's a little more challenging at Hopkins because of the degree of um, distance and just um, elementary needs are, I have fewer resources in the elementary than they have in the secondary building. So I've um, said over and over, I'd love a chance to work closer with Brian Beck on some changes at the secondary level. I say those are still on the wish list in great part, but not um, totally unattended to. I'm here for the student services meeting on a weekly basis. I'm also here on IEPs when I'm invited to those annuals and on every initial or reevaluation meeting. Those are the same conditions on the elementary level. I do have um, opportunity to get invitations to go to staff meetings at the elementary on a regular basis and at a less frequent basis from 
staff at the secondary level who may ask me to participate in a um, department head meeting or a faculty meeting. Um, I did work with the faculty in Hopkins last year on identifying some mid-year slump in their student grades that was pretty significant and we really evaluated what was happening with the expectations for those students because it was more than we thought we should be seeing at mid-year and that turned out to be a very productive exercise. Um, the assessment of my communication strategies, um, I, I don't have a formal method except it's been nice to have both the PACs and the school committee's feedback in the student and family surveys and some of that I can attribute back to special education services. Um, I think the most in, um, informal way, but probably the most significant to me, will be um, student outcomes. So whether I have a child with a continuing problem or a resolved problem or something, a sustainable solution, those to me are signs of success, of communication, and also effective problem solving. So I do see student progress as the largest marker of um, communication success. And I am hoping that we see more improvement in the MCAS scores with our initiative in the last 18 months to see reading scores go even further. Um, we'll have to see how those state reports come out. I think that uh, another marker regarding the state data is how often we get complaints filed with the state, whether we have mediations or hearings that have um, had to go that far along where we could not resolve problems by ourselves. And to this date in three years, we've only had one request for mediation, and we have not had any requests for hearing. So I see those as signs of effective communication with families to solve problems before they get so large that no one feels they can do it without the state's help. So I think that answers all of your points. <laughs> and I feel like I talked a lot. <laughs> But um, if there are anything in particular I didn't touch on, um, I welcome any questions from you or parents sitting behind me. I'm yes. um, could you describe the changes in special education administration in the proposed new arrangement and the role of the special education administrator in interacting with the SPED coordinator, teachers, and parents? Yeah, I believe that the, the model that we're proposing will be highly successful. Could you explain it? to? Because I don't think people listening at home necessarily know. Yes, I'd be happy that. to do that. So the, the coordinator's um, position will be in um, one who is uh, in the school every day, dealing with students, dealing with teachers, and most importantly, taking the reins on every IEP and its implementation in the buildings. So that person um, will take responsibility for a large part of what teachers do in coordination with my, you know, I, I read them all, I stamp it with approval, make you know, connections with people if I need to. But it's definitely a large enough job that one person will be very, very busy taking on that responsibility. But the good part of what I imagine will happen is that she will be able to take the IEP drafting process and evaluations um, and progress monitoring from some of the teachers' caseloads. And that will allow many more hours for staff to devote on intervention design, spending time with students. And um, I, I see that one person as a really, um, the person that we've hired, I, I'm most impressed with um, her effectiveness and her organization that has been demonstrated in her interviews and also when we checked her references. I think she's going to add a great efficiency to the process at the same time that she relieves the burden of some of those tasks from the teaching um, staff. So that I think will be a beautiful thing. Um, I do think that my role with her will be to, um, I will still have the responsibility of signing off on every IEP, so I know I'm still going to get to see what every child's up to and what every 
staff member's role in that child's um, day is. I also see that I'll be doing the state required administrative tasks that um, only someone with a license as a special ed director can perform and that will stay my duty. I do expect to be part of the leadership team and I hope that I will have more time to implement some of the ideas that I see benefiting students in the special ed realm, but also all students to increase their opportunities to maximize their skills and at the same time reduce their stress. <laughs> so that's sort of what I, my goal is in maintaining a role as the special ed director. Do you guys have any questions? No. Can I ask one while you, th if you're, okay. um, when Donna started, we realized that we had, um, um, that we weren't doing very well with professional development uh, across both schools and across all the things that we needed to focus on. And we did some targeted professional development. Have you, what's your experience with how we're doing with professional development now and have we, remedied the weaknesses of that? Well, I, I would say that that topic is one that needs more discussion because I know that it's um, a balancing act to identify where there may be an increased need of attention in the skills of a teacher or a, a, a body of teachers or an understanding of um, what students bring to the table these days because I think that that is a challenge for a lot of teachers that they don't really appreciate the differences in the students that we're bringing up in the technology age and um, we have to be adaptable to that. Uh, I did a significant amount of training um, a number of years back in universal design and I think that although it's you know they love to draw the the ramp up the wheelchair ramp up and the stairs over here and they're just shoveling the stairs instead of the ramp you know that old cartoon about its universal design I think that um, it, it is so much broader than that and I think if people understood that they would open their minds to a lot more flexibility in their classrooms and in te um, student experiences and assessment. So that's something I am interested in presenting more about to the faculty. We made an attempt last year to start um, opening doors and a couple people have started to open doors, but in terms of a whole faculty, we're not there yet. And the balancing, so that's my side of the seesaw. <laughs> I think every, teaching staff or paraprofessional staff probably has interests and goals of their own. And matching the district goals with their goals is that tipping point that we'd like to find the balance of meeting everyone's needs and hopes for professional development with something that's um, productive, universal, and also meets student needs. Can, will you do me the favor of um, one of the things we talked about last week as you were talking about kind of how kids are learning differently partially because of devices and screens. How do you think that's going to change how we deliver services? I, I'm not an expert in that. I know that I try to read up about it. I have connections in the academic world that tell me things about it. Um, I think I would love to be a member of a team looking at that. I just know that children come to the table with a different set of wiring. And um, when and you watch them in play, <laughs> when you watch them outside of the school environment, they're going to gravitate to certain activities that we can learn from. And that's what we need to be more astute in figuring out. Um, I think that it opens up a lot of potential, and that's why I like universal design, because that allows a lot of flexibility. And children need to show us how they best learn and how do they best demonstrate what they learn. Because I think there's a lot of great teachers here. 
And I think kids come out with a lot of information, but we also have to acknowledge the fact that their creativity with that world at their feet has got to be the most important um, final product for us, that we need to allow students to leave here being creative and knowledgeable. And so I, I see that that's part of understanding the way they are wired differently. And, um, and I, I think we have a lot to learn still. Do you guys have anything else? I might add, just as a PS, though, we are, <laughs> I always have something else to say, and it's, I'm way past my time. Um, so I think that we're already using technology in ways that's really benefited students on an individual basis and in the whole classrooms. Um, so, you know, I just got a request today again from, am I going to buy that? Um, UPAR, you know, it's a technology-based assessment to determine where children best use technology and it's um, a per head cost but I think we might be able to put it into the 240 grant next year and really have an assessment tool ready for kids um, to determine what um, ass assess I mean assistive technology they could use best in reading and in writing that'd be very cool so I better excuse myself because thank you, Pat. It was oh, it's always good to interview you on television again. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you for allowing me a little extra time. Thank you.